Good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm going to split the presentation into two. Uh, the first half we'll look at Europe, and the second half we'll look at the UK. So, moving on. Uh, looking at Europe, you can see from this chart that Europe continues to be impacted by uncertainty, uh, weak economic sentiment, uh, both the Eurozone and Germany seeing steady declines in economic sentiment over the last 18 months or so, whilst the UK has stabilised at a rather subdued level. Any boosts that we have seen to confidence have been relatively short-lived. Uh, so what the IMF and the United Nations are both saying is that these high levels of economic uncertainty are crippling investment and economic activity. The result of this is that you've got a number of corporates, or most corporates, sitting on significant cash piles. US corporates sitting on about $1.7 trillion worth of cash. International businesses sitting on about $5 trillion worth of cash. So effectively, foreign direct investment and business expansion plans are largely on hold. Just looking a bit more closely at the Eurozone and German economies. You can see here the Eurozone dipping into negative territory. And worryingly for the rest of Europe, Germany in a sort of fairly persistent state of uh, decline over recent quarters. There is a real danger that the Eurozone could drift into a, a structural depression. Now, just looking, I've put this slide up to, to demonstrate the sort of relative sizes of the main uh, countries in Europe, some of the key economies, uh, partly as a proxy for the size of the investable universe in these markets. Places like Poland and Sweden are often talked about as popular uh, locations for real estate investment. But you can see from this chart, in terms of relative size of the economies and thus the investment markets, they're relatively small players. Germany remains the powerhouse in Europe but it can't afford, avoid the slowdown that we're seeing uh, impacted by the slowing in the world economy. France is weak, remains positive growth at the moment, but that looks likely to be heading towards uh, a recessionary environment as we move into 2013, given the austerity measures that are being put in place. <coughs> and whilst places like Poland remain relatively strong, again, it's not immune from the slowdown in the countries that surround it. Just looking at Experian's uh, annual growth figures here, Spain sees two years of negative growth. Sweden and Poland show respectable growth, but at much reduced rates over the, the levels that we've seen more recently. And UK, France and Germany, as the main drivers of European growth, remain stubbornly sluggish going forwards. So the implications for real estate are that expansionary demand is going to remain fairly subdued as we move into next year. <coughs> Turning to the investment market, again, the EMEA transaction levels have been impacted by weak confidence. Uh, you can see the levels there drifting down to around about 30, 130 billion on, on a rolling basis. Uh, and whilst the EMEA and America's levels have recovered since the post Lehman's trough, they <coughs> remain at about 45% of the level seen at the peak of the market. On the other hand, in Asia-Pac, you've seen quite a dramatic turnaround with investment volumes almost trebling since 2009. So as we look forward into 2013, I think given the weak economic outlook in Europe, I think it's unlikely that we're going to see any sort of marked improvement in EMEA transactions. A modest improvement, perhaps, but a marked <coughs> improvement, unlikely. I'm going to show you a few slides here from the soon-to-be-launched Collier's Global Investor Survey. This will be launched next week. Um, this is the third year we've run this survey, and uh, it involves participants from the 62 countries in which Collier's are represented. We've got a sample of uh, close to 500 key players in the global markets. So for EMEA investors, we've got a relatively positive outlook going forwards, slightly improving over the next six and 12 months, and certainly more positive over the next five years on the back of economic growth. 
Encouragingly, about um, over a third of EMEA investors believe that property investment market conditions will improve over the next six months. <coughs> We've got 56% believing that now is a good time to invest in real estate. And 59% planning to expand their portfolios over the next six months. Now the counter to this is that 77% of those respondents were likely to, or very likely to, use debt to expand their investment. Uh, now, given the issues and problems uh, in obtaining debt at the moment, it remains to be seen whether their objectives will come through to fruition. It's certainly going to be a challenge. Now, in terms of where these investors are looking to place their money over the next 12 months or so, this differs across the EMEA region. Uh, in Western Europe, the focus on CBD offices and logistics and industrial. In Central Europe, CBD offices, shopping centres and residential development. And the Middle East and North Africa, residential development, hotels and other real estate uh, related, uh, infrastructure related areas like education and healthcare. In terms of city focus, really driven by the sample and favouring very much the sort of um, safe haven locations, the transparent markets, London comes out strongly, Paris, Munich, <coughs> and in the more localised markets, uh, Moscow and Warsaw, also uh, driven strongly by domestic investors. So just looking at the year to date, this is RCA data and shows the the dominance of London and Paris in terms of where investment has been taking place. Uh, London, Paris, extremely dominant, mirroring what happened in 2011. So the money flowing towards those deep, liquid, transparent markets, safe havens in Europe. If you also look at the top seven German city regions, that accounts for just over 13 billion euros worth of transactions. So again, Germany has been seen as a relatively safe place to invest over the course of this year. I think going forward, it's unlikely that we're going to see any dramatic changes in this profile. But given the weakening outlook in France, it may be that some investors start to divert some of the money that's been going to Paris into other markets. And again, it's quite likely that London will be a beneficiary of any of that transfer. So looking uh, briefly at the occupier markets, I'm just going to focus on the office markets here. Um, office markets across Europe generally fairly flat, uh, although what we are seeing is vacancy rates beginning to fall in a number of the CBD locations. If you look at the trends in rents, again flat across most territories, uh, the exceptions being London, City and West End and Moscow, which have seen substantial increases. Again, going forward, I don't think we see, you know, given the economic situation, we don't see any dramatic changes in this. Um, Moscow and London probably continue to see some rental growth, but we are seeing continued absorption in a number of the major European cities, absorption of good quality space, very little investment. And I think there are one or two centres like Munich and Stockholm where vacancy rates have fallen and demand remains relatively robust, where we'd like to see a bit of rental growth coming through. Just one slide on logistics. A couple of points for you to think about. E-commerce <coughs> and infrastructure. Uh, the UK has been leading the field in terms of internet shopping, uh, now moving across into sort of mobile and tablet shopping, of course. Uh, internet shopping accounting for about 12% of total retail sales in the UK. And you can see that other markets in Europe are some way behind that. So what we would expect to see is an increase in these market shares over the coming years as the penetration in these territories improves, as people become more familiar with um, and more comfortable with the security of buying and having delivery at home. So this, uh, obviously, the implications for town centres, high street shopping centres, are well talked about in the UK. We may well see some of those impacts starting to come through in parts of Europe. But the other side is the logistics and for those 
logistics operators servicing both the retailers and the consumers. So there's implications for both the B2C and B2B markets. The other area to think about uh, from a logistics standpoint is infrastructure. Now, Collius has produced uh, several white papers this year on the EMEA logistics markets. These are available from our website. Uh, one of those deals with road infrastructure, investment that's going into road infrastructure in Europe. Poland is a good example of this, where new routes are being opened up, and this will lead to the evolution of new logistics nodes as accessibility improves. Second area is to look at what's happening in the development of deep water ports, particularly in Turkey and in the Adriatic. These ports will accommodate the new larger Maersk 5 container ships, and that's going to divert some trade away from the northern seaports into Turkey and southern Italy. Again, this is going to have implications for freight forwarding and breakpoints across southern and central Europe. And finally, we're beginning to see a far better integrated rail network. Um, the European Commission you know, has strong drivers to move a lot of freight from road to rail, reduce emissions. Uh, so we are seeing a much more integrated rail service, which will help deliver freight from Turkish ports up through central, uh, southern and central Europe into the Western European heartlands. So those are three areas to have a look at or, or perhaps talk about later in this morning. So just to round up on um, Europe, so will anything change in 2013? Well, my view is probably not a great deal. You know, we can continue to see uncertainty in the Eurozone and it's going to continue to impact on business confidence and the real estate markets. Recession is becoming a reality in a number of European territories as we move into 2013. We're unlikely to see even modest growth until the second half of next year. Bank lending is going to continue to act as a drag. Uh, and where bank lending is available, it's only going to be available to those people who meet very stringent lending conditions and are prepared to pay the price. We've already seen the emergence of some new lenders, the insurance companies, and some new mezzanine funds being launched, and I think this is an area that we will see continue to grow in 2013, uh, filling the gap left by the retreating mainstream banks. I think investors are going to continue to focus on prime product, and they're going to continue to focus on transparent, deep and liquid markets. Uh, wealth preservation is going to stay high on the strategic agenda. But there will be opportunities for those to prepare to take on more risk. But for you to take advantage of that, it's important to have your finance in place. So I'll move on to the UK. Uh, in the UK, we seem to take one step forward and two steps back. Um, I think as many of us expected, we've been bouncing along the bottom this year. It's been a challenging economic environment and a challenging property market. But let's look on the good side. We did have a strong GDP figure in Q3, but we all know that that was distorted by external factors, the Olympic, Olympic ticket sales, and a bounce back from a very weak Q2 as a result of the additional bank holidays. <coughs> Unfortunately, looking at the forward-looking indi indicators that have been put out more recently, it's quite possible that we could move into negative territory in Q4. So God forbid that we're looking at a triple dip. Let's hope not. However, for Osborne, he's got a positive GDP figure. He's got some backing from the IMF. He has got a little bit more flexibility to relax some of the austerity measures should he choose to do so. The next important date is December the 6th, where the autumn financial statement should give us a little bit more clarity about where economic policy will go over the next 12 to 18 months. <coughs> In the meantime, we expect the Bank of England to remain supportive and produce further QE as and when it's deemed necessary. So looking at the investment market in the UK, um, a challenging year, 
And we don't think that the volumes this year will match the 32 billion that we achieved in 2011. Our estimate is that we'll hit about 29 billion by the end of this year. What we have seen, of course, is central London taking a larger chunk of that investment market, uh, accounting for about 38% of transactions by value for the year to date versus 27% last year. On the basis that we don't get any further external shocks and that we do see some modest improvement in the UK economy during the course of 2013, we expect volumes to grow modestly to around 35 billion next year. Just looking at some IPD data here to reflect the state of the market, and you can see this tail to the right-hand side of the chart. The market's very flat. We're seeing no rental growth and modest capital falls. Uh, and we don't expect to see any dramatic turnaround in the short term in that situation. I'll talk about our forecasts before the end of the presentation. What we do expect to see is a continuation of the, of the uh, polarisation that we're seeing in the UK market, prime versus non-prime and London versus the rest of the UK. We think investors will remain risk averse, so they're going to concentrate on uh, solid income producing product. And whilst non-prime is beginning to attract some interest because of the pricing movements, obtaining finance to, to fund those purchases remains a challenge. And London versus the rest of the UK will generally occupy markets outside of London remain pretty flat. Uh, there's very little expansionary demand. We don't expect that to change significantly. So any take up in the market is really being driven by churn, by lease breaks and expiries. So we expect to see very little, very limited rental growth outside of London. But as I mentioned in Europe, in some of the CBD centres, the, the regional cities in London, what we are seeing is the absorption of quality office space. And combined with very limited new development, you're beginning to see, uh, we expect to see some rental pressure coming through in the course of 2013 in cities like Manchester, <coughs> Leeds and Birmingham. And similarly, on the logistics and industrial side, almost total lack of speculative development very limited design and build, and this is leading to, leaving, leading to very limited options for any occupiers that require expansionary space. Now, we're beginning to see that have an impact in West London, where it's beginning to push rents up. We're not quite seeing that come through in other parts of the country yet. What we need to see is a bit more sustained economic growth through the course of 2013, and then you'll begin to see some pinch points in the regions in some of the logistics markets. Just turning to retail, looking at our annual rental collection, and this demonstrates the difference between London and the rest of the country, London and the southeast in this case. The red bars indicate number of centres that have seen rental increases between mid-2011 and mid-2012, very much focused on London and the southeast. And in terms of percentage increases in rent, London is the only region in the country that has seen real rental uplift. It's really quite dispiriting to look at rest across the right-hand side of the bar. Every other region seeing real falls in rents. Again, we don't expect that to change over the course of the next 12 months. The London market, particularly the West End, is driven by fairly robust demand from both domestic and international retailers. Um, and there's very limited new space coming uh, in terms of adding to stock. Where there may be opportunities are looking at some of the, the parallel streets, the tangential streets to the main shopping areas, and the new sort of luxury clusters that are emerging in the West End, where you're currently operating off relatively low rents. Maybe worth looking at some of those for uh, future opportun opportunities. And just before I move on to our forecast, to quickly look at the important city and West End markets. Um, it's been well publicised, the importance of the technology sector in terms of take-up over the last 12, 12 months or so, even in the city market. You can see here uh, TMT representing 36% of take-up in the year to date. 
So as business services and banking and finance have declined, TMT has absorbed some of that space. If we drill down and look at the city core against Midtown and Fringe, you can see how important the technology sector has been to driving take up in those more peripheral areas, accounting for over 60% of take up. So these companies are looking for more competitively priced, price, priced space. They're looking for slightly edgier locations and often quirkier buildings. And just looking down at some of our absorption figures, this is looking at city core in red. You can see whilst absorption has remained positive, it's tailed off to being fairly marginal in the first half of this year. Whereas look at Clark and Well and Farringdon, very strong absorption driven by the technology sector. And a quick look at the West End. Uh, West End as a whole, absorption has turned slightly negative after two and a half years of very strong positive absorption. But again, if we drill down and look at some of these sub-markets, you can see that Mayfair has been very disappointing in the first half of this year, partly due to a couple of new buildings come through in Hanover Square and Grosvenor Hill, adding to the stock. But what we are finding is that occupiers are being a bit more footloose. Um, they're looking more for more competitively priced quality space, and this has been benefiting the Victoria market here, shown in the dark blue. Uh, so land security is one of the beneficiaries of that um, type of take-up. And just to look at some headline figures on rents in terms of where we think they're going. In the West End, headline rents for grade A space are currently at about £105 a square foot. We believe there's pressure on those rents and they could rise to £110 plus by year end. And because of the diversity of occupier demand in the West End and the fact that you get limited new stock coming through, we believe that rents will be steadily pushed up towards £150 a square foot by 2015. And let's not forget that they're already talking about £150 a square foot at 30 Barclay Square. So that may not be unreasonable, though it sounds a very high figure. In the city, um, non-tower space is currently at about £57.50. Uh, obviously, the space that's coming through is more lumpy. Um, a lot of that has already been pre-let. But again, we believe that there's steady demand, particularly from the business services sector, for units of 40,000, 50,000 square feet, which will drive the core grade A market and continue to push rents up to close to £75 a square foot by 2015. So at that level, you're <coughs> surpassing the peaks that were seen in 2008 and, uh, well, 1988 and 2007. So finally, just to look at our forecasts, um, not terribly <coughs> exciting, I'm afraid. Uh, this is rental growth. You can see that the office sector is the only sector where we anticipate any rental growth in 2013, and that is driven very much by what's happening in the central London markets. We expect a bounce back in 2014 as we begin to see a little bit of economic traction, but overall not terribly exciting. And in terms of total return, very weak out turn expected for 2012 of less than 2%. That was more sort of income-based return in 2013 and then a stronger recovery as we get the economic growth coming through in 2014 led by logistics. In terms of a five-year annualised figure, Perhaps a rather disappointing 7%, but that average is brought down by a very weak 2012 total return. So, in conclusion, we've got deteriorating, a deteriorating situation in most European economies, and that's not going to help the real estate markets in Europe or the UK. We think Eurozone uncertainty is going to continue to impact on confidence across Europe and the UK. Now, assuming there are no external shocks, we think that the UK is approaching the end of a very long tunnel. But economic recovery, let's make no bones about it, is going to be slow. As a result, expansionary demand is going to remain subdued. On a positive note, EMEA investors are becoming more positive and most wish to expand their portfolios. The counter to that is the number of them that require debt to do so 
So whether those objectives are achieved remains questionable. We expect to see further growth in new, uh, new lending from the insurance companies and further development of mezzanine funds to partially fill the gap left by the retreating banks. Investors are going to remain risk averse. We see pretty much more of the same, um, again with wealth creation staying high on the agenda. And opportunities do exist, particularly as secondary pricing continues to adjust, but for you to take advantage of those opportunities, you really need to have your funding in place. I'm sorry I can't give you a more positive message, but I think this is the reality, although many of you out there might disagree. I mean, you know, this is the opportunity for people on the panel and in the audience to state their case.